Hi, I'm Roy Murphy. You're watching the BitConnect YouTube channel. Coming up in today's video. BitConnect Trading Bot Transactions. Hello, I'm Roy Murphy. Welcome back to the BitConnect YouTube channel. Today we will be digging into much more than what this title suggests. Because this holds true not only for BitConnect, but also for Ethconnect, for Hextracoin, for Regalcoin, and for Electrocoin there is something more going on in the background between all of these than meets the eye. I know they all look very, very similar. Some of them are more similar than others. Uh, there is something going on and we will be digging into that today in this video. So this may be quite a long video. I've got lots of tabs prepped, ready and open. Uh, but I really want you to bear with me on this because we're not only going to be talking about the uh, trading bot transactions and trying to find them. We did a video before um, on the BitConnect trading bot revealed and that gave just as many questions as it did answers. So um, this is the follow up video to that with, where we dig in even deeper. So if you want to know more about the trading bot, um, Hold that thought and we'll get into that shortly. But first of all, market news. Um, before we hit the market news, I want to talk about YouTube. Um, now, any of my regular guests, uh, any of those who signed up, all my subscribers excluded. On this channel, our spam filters are set extremely high. I spent a long time playing with them to get them just right. No personal referral links are allowed. No links or redirects. There are over 500 keywords that will send your comment straight into my spam box. Now, I log into that two or three times a day and I will inevitably delete 99% of them so that you guys don't have to wade through pages and pages of crap. Okay, so only good, insightful content here, please. Spammers, either get a real job or be more creative. Um, make a banner, pay to have it placed somewhere. <laughs> Try Google AdWords or Facebook advertising or make a blog. Engage people, make a video, give something back. Um, so spammers beware, your efforts are futile. Now that's the end of my little rant for today. Uh, let's get on with the market news. So market news, Bitcoin Gold will, be, will not be credited on BitConnect. Bitcoin Gold is a proposed fork to the Bitcoin coin network which would result in a separate currency on an entirely different blockchain. Although sim similar to the Bitcoin Cash fork on August the 1st, it will not be included in BitConnect. Um, I think the reason why is not many people, if you look at the price of Bitcoin Gold, how it's plummeted before it's even gone live, um, you will see there are various reasons why uh, BitConnect wouldn't want to get involved mainly because of the value and two the adoption process and three you're in two groups and if you're in one group then bitcoin cash makes sense uh, bitcoin gold not so so if you are holding bitcoin only in bitconnect you will not receive the private keys to be able to claim your bitcoin cash which is pretty much worthless anyway but that's not the point um, if you do have bitcoin and you do want to be included in the Bitcoin Gold, uh, bearing in mind that if you do hold your private keys, you will also get the equivalent value, or not the value, the, the equivalent uh, amount of Bitcoin uh, distributed in your Bitcoin Gold wallet. So bear in mind, if you do want to get on, in on it, I can't imagine why you would, but some, some are inclined that way. If you do want to, then you're gonna need to move some of your Bitcoin into a wallet or an exchange where you get to at least um, have an exchange that supports it, be able to export your private keys and then you can get hold of your free Bitcoin gold. Um, next, uh, upcoming BitConnect prepares to celebrate its annual ceremony in Thailand. So that is actually happening as of recording in about eight hours. So I don't know if I can get on a plane in time. I, I wasn't invited anyway. <laughs> um, this is going to be big news over the next 24 hours. I'm sure we are going to see loads and loads of videos on this. Uh, some feedback from, um, from this big event. There are loads and loads of people going, uh, mainly from uh, East Asia and from Australia and China. Um, but the information coming back from there, there are a few people out there in the field associated with the channel that will be out there reporting. So as that news comes in, 
I'm sure not only on this channel will we be talking about it, I'm sure there'll be loads on YouTube. So keep an eye out for that over the next few days. And next on our list, Blockchain Expo North America. Now this is in Santa Clara in California. Now this, I believe, is on the 29th and 30th uh, over that weekend in, um, in November. Now I would love to go. I did get an invite and I really, 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 really want to go. Unfortunately, I will be doing a talk myself um, and that is at the Blockchain Summit in London on the 28th. So with the time zone difference in the UK, getting to California 10 hours, I would have already missed more than half the expo. So um, as much as I'd love to go, I really cannot. Um, is anyone going? Any of you guys going? Let me know if you are. Let me know in the comments box uh, if anyone is going. Um, someone, if you see Craig Grant or Travon James, uh, tell them that Roy says hi and uh, give him my best and tell him to hook me up. So uh, I think we can now safely go to Coin Market Cap. Let's look at see what the markets are doing. Coin Market Cap today, 172 billion. That's up 2.8 billion on yesterday. Uh, Bitcoin's dominance uh, is up today. It's 57.7%. Uh, yesterday it was around 56.6. So Bitcoin is doing well. I imagine this figure over the next year or two to drop down to about 25% because of all the. Um, the market is a growing marketplace, although Bitcoin, I think, will be number one for a long time. Bitcoin, uh, it's been hovering in and out of the uh, $100 billion mark, which is great. Price at just under $6,000. Uh, skip the rest. Uh, we'll talk about Ethereum another time. Um, BitConnect, again, is at an all-time high. We're still at number eight. Uh, turnover of $7.3 million and a price today of $219.50. Fantastic. So let's get into what we were talking about. So before we start talking about the trading bot, we've gone into some details on the trading bot itself. And we've gone through the APIs and the endpoints and where you can find them, uh, the way you can dig into repositories and the way you can go through the source code to find out what it's doing and where it's going. If you are talented enough and skilled enough, you can find them. Um, now that doesn't always keep everybody happy because those who are of a lesser nature, who are less understanding or not versed in these kind of languages, they say, no, I, I want to see, I want to see what it is. Why are they hiding it? So in order for us to dig into that, if, as this is a follow on video from the last video we did on the BitConnect bot, we're going to go a little bit deeper today, but we need to give you some more perspective. And before we dig into the, into everything, what we need to do is to go through some certain understandings that we need to have about business in general, general business practices when it comes to the tech industry and data. And you will see how this ties in with the uh, with all these different uh, trading platforms that we're seeing now, including BitConnect, but also including some of the others and how they are closely tied, what information they're sharing and how do they look so similar if they are different companies written and controlled by different people. So that is the assumption and we'll go through to see if that assumption is correct. So bear with me. This may be long, but do not skip because you need to understand all of these steps. So we need to understand biz, uh, big business practices. OK, the practices that big business does in the tech world. We need to understand data integration. That's something that is key to understanding this, this point. Data sharing. We need to look at the concepts of data sharing, how it is shared and by whom and what they gain from sharing that information. Resource pooling. So you've got your affiliate programs and promoters and partnerships. That is all part of the resource pooling. This is the networking between companies of a similar nature. OK, we have that in the tech world. We have that with these bot trading lending platforms. OK, think about it. We also have development libraries. We need to talk about development libraries and how they're used. Um, strategic partnerships. Now, we'll be looking at a strategic partnership that will help you dis discover the types of things that are shared technically between companies that help both parties. OK, and then we'll look at the use cases for BitConnect and EthConnect and all of the others. OK. And then finally, we need to understand the concept of APIs, schemas and endpoints, because this is to do with the way that information is moved about and how they are recorded and how they are requested and how they are received. So it all ties in. If you understand those points, you will be able to figure out and understand how the trading bot is doing its trading 
and also where that trading bot lives and where it come comes from, who controls it and what it is doing on a daily basis, minute by minute. So, you know, everyone is looking for these elusive, secretive trading bots. Now, in the last video I did on BitConnect, a trading bot, in uh, the, the video is called um, BitConnect Trading Bot Discovered. We looked at the bot footprint. Okay, we looked at the APIs, the calls, the transaction IDs, the wallets involved, and how the bot works. Now, the response with, was either, uh, great, that really helps, or thanks, that really alleviates any fears I had uh, for those that understood what I was saying. And for those that didn't, it's like, I, I need to see proof. All those people that didn't understand what I was saying, what they're saying is, I don't understand you, Roy. I need to see something. I need something visual. And it's not that easy. And it's not the case of being hidden. We're talking about obfuscation. That's something very, very different. So because of this something called obfuscation, giving you a list of IP addresses to ping, which I've done, it would reduce the number of people who can see it. Just you need to be a seasoned programmer to be able to do it properly and to understand it. So, and the other problem is that pinging the addresses, the addresses take, uh, move all the time because of this obfuscation uh, round robin that they're doing. And it's also to do with reverse proxy IPs and there's loads of reasons why you can't track them minute by minute. She, I'd have to do it live, I'd have to do a live stream and it would take a lot of setting up. I may even do that. That could be another video that we could do and I'm sure that loads of people would jump on. If you want to see me find and trace the trading bot in real time, give this video a like and tell me I want to see that live. If I get 50 people that say I want to see you do that, I will make a video and I will live stream it for you, okay? So obfuscation. So laymen still want proof. So I give them all the places, all the addresses, the code, the binaries, the platform, the language, the scripts. I explain it in detail how it works, um, but it all sits behind a local IP address. So only internal servers can talk to each other, which is a security feature, you know, by data transfer off the World Wide Web. It makes sense, doesn't it? Nope. <laughs> those that don't understand why they got something to hide they say you know so these things keep cropping up so I need to give you an analogy I need to give you guys some perspective so let's try and get some perspective I'll do this as quickly as I can um, but I need to cover all of these points so we're going to go off track a little bit because I need you to understand the way that all this data kind of ties up now this is a local property um, this is a real estate agent near me. Okay, now there are lots of them. I've just picked the first one at random. Everyone where you are, doesn't matter where you are in the world, you will be able to find a real estate agent uh, and you'll be able to go to their website and you'll be able to search local listings that they have um, on their book. So this is the nearest one to me and all of these are all near me. So, um, you know, I, I don't want to labor the point too much, but where does all this information come from? So to get a house like this, obviously you have an estate agent, they go out and do all the legwork, um, they send a photographer around who may be an in-house or, or, or he could be out of house. They package all of that, they get the information, they do the designs, they take the pictures of the house and they put it somewhere. What they don't put it on is their own system. They put it on a system, a software system that they trust and they are subscribed to in order to get this A on their website and B more importantly on the big search engines and on the big um, property um, property listings. So this is great for their website but how many people compared to your local um, property search engine will actually get to see these houses? So unless you actually are local and you find this, you need to have bigger exposure. So this is where data sharing works both ways. Now, not too many moons ago, four or five years ago, I did some work for this company and I, I'm not promoting anything in particular. It's just something that I know inside out uh, because I worked there for nearly two years. I was brought in because I was local to the local company. Um, I'd had lots of exposure to the biggest uh, property software 
partnership page and content language provider, which is Rightmove in the UK. Uh, I'll, I'll go through the equivalents in your country, but everyone's got one there, you know. But it's all based on the Rightmove schema. Now, I'd worked with the Rightmove schema, and it was just so happened to be in my CV, and the, these guys called me as an outside uh, resourcer and said, Roy, can you come and help us? We're growing at an, an accelerated rate. We want to move up into the data industry. Um, can you help us out with our platform because it keeps falling down, we've got too many users, it's not built very well, we built it very quickly, we need to make it more secure, we need to add all these different products. So let's go through the products, so the type of products that this company would sell. This is a software company and it's a property software management company. So they produce, Dupix will produce software for estate agents to be able to log in as an account, it's, it's in the cloud, and they can put all their details on and it will be spread across the property board on all of the advertising platforms, uh, okay? And it does it in real time. So if you look at the software, you've got property software, uh, management software, commercial software, agricultural, so that's all about the software. They also have extra training, which is an extra revenue, so they've got syllabus training, bespoke training. Um, they've got client services, so they've got they they will design property brochures for you. They'll do the back end of the website for you. They'll build you a website. They'll do the design, and they'll also create the digital displays. And part of one of my jobs was to bring all this on board. So the digital displays are when you go to a real estate agent. They're the flashy screens with all the rollovers that are fed directly by the system. So that's what a company like this does. And when I went to the company, I was I think I was number eleven. I was one of eleven people and they were growing at a big rate and they wanted to grow. So we grew that, uh, we had a development team, um, we started working with the right move schema and we'll go through what that means in a minute. Um, but we, we, we built up, so I ended up with a team of 135 people within nine months. So let's look at that. So when I was there after two years, it was bought out and it was bought out by a company who you may have seen, um, this is a well-respected um, newspaper in the UK. It's one of the top four, one of the big four. This is The Guardian. Now, there was a group called The Guardian Media Group, and they owned lots of media, not just The Guardian. Um, and they took over when The Guardian went online. So many of you in your countries have also got a, a version of the very first version of Autotrader. There's an autotrader.co.uk, which is the first one, and that was spread um, throughout the lands, there's uh, I think there's an autotrader.com, which is the American version, which came later. Now, I remember as a kid, Autotrader was uh, was like a, a like a, a white pages or a yellow pages in the UK. It was a big thick book, and it had all the trading, all the cars, all the prices, all the pictures, and then it had all the new cars at the back. And it was a it was something that was very popular before the internet. Guardian Media Group bought this because they wanted to digitize everything, but they didn't realize how much. Uh, competition there was so they started losing lots and lots of their um, their referrers uh, their advertisers their sponsors and people went elsewhere where it was cheaper so they started losing revenue on this and they bought Dupix uh, just before I left so that's that now Autotrader also exists in America uh, and Canada um, so that's their version but so it should be familiar to you Zoopla is what was later what is now owned by the same company so Zoopla is one of the biggest property um, and commercial estate agent uh, listing pages so if you search for anything you'll either use Rightmove in the UK or Zoopla now Zoopla's it's the only thing that has a different schema now the schema that they use the schema is the is the platform it's the way that all of the boxes and everything work and integrate with each other and the api calls and the information that comes in and goes out they use a completely different schema so zoopla they came in as a late a late starter but they tailored all of their results and their their business plan their revenue stream is based on data instead of property and estate agents so this company now owns the company that I worked for many years ago. So that's the difference between the two. So in the US, you've got Realtor.com, which is one of the biggest ones. And then one of the other ones which I've worked on for a long time is Zillow. Um, I've used lots of the API keys and I've done lots of data transfer for Zillow. Um, but if you look, this is the number one in the UK. It's called Rightmove. 
So um, let's go and do a search. So if I search for um, search my village, okay, and I go for sale. So I'm going to search uh, within three miles, I think. So we'll go search radius three miles. So these are the different parts of the schema that are all the same. So if I now go to find properties, we can now see um, this is the nearest one to me. I actually know this guy um, built this about three years ago. It's 87 acres. He's just sold another 60 acres, which is why it's only now 28 million pounds. Um, so these are all local houses to me. And all of this comes from all these different data points. So these are all different estate agents, as you can see, Fisher German and then Knight Frank. So each one of these different estate agents uses this software and all of it gets integrated into one place where people can search. This is how data is monopolized and moved. Now, Rightmove has a different plan. It has a different revenue stream. It uses, it uses all of these connectors for a very, very small revenue. And they have a very small piece of the pie. What they're trying to do is make a bigger pie. The bigger the pie, the more money they make. That is their business philosophy. So that is right move. So something that I created uh, for this. Now this I created for Dupix, which later became part of the schema for right move. And it's called draw research. And I, this is, I actually built this over a few days. Um, it sounds really simple, but before you couldn't just draw anything. You can actually draw an area and now you can view properties. So you can actually draw in places and then the results come up. So this is something I drew for one company, it got sold to Rightmove and now every single company that does property listings uses this technology. And it came from one developer for you know half a day's work or a day's work. And you can then click on that and you know you can click on the, any of these houses and um, you can see things for sale. So that is a way that technology built for one can be implemented uh, implemented within the same industry for other things. Now, Rightmove also do data services. Now, I don't want to go too deep into this because you've got market intelligence. This is something I brought on, uh, big data. Uh, you've got development insight reports. You've got area analysis. Now, they're trying to catch up with Zoopla on these uh, house price indexes and everything. This is from the data stack, and they're now realizing that's where the money is. It's in data, data exchanges. This is why Google and Facebook are worth so much not because you put your pictures on it's because of the data they have the data they can sell it's the advertising it's the it's the marketplace itself which which is worth something so if we go to now this is something that i worked to integrate uh, very early on so we wanted to be able to give estate agents something generic that they could use on our system that meant that they could integrate with Rightmove. So it was called a real-time data feed. So they put something in and the data comes out. So you can see the types of data. Now I don't want to go, I want to gloss over this very, very quickly. Um, but what you can see here, you have the objects, you have the field names, you have the data types, you have the description of the data type uh, for the user and whether it is required for the use um, of the program. So all of these yeses means you have to include this as part of the string, as part of the data. So this gives developers an idea of what they can build against. Now, there's two different ways of getting that information across. One is the old school of uh, get and post, uh, which is from the HTML um, sending. And then you've got uh, JSON, which is from an a or XML schema. So this is a schema of information of how it is used. It is the platform, it is the framework of how data is moved and stored. And it's the criteria it needs to, to be able to give you a response. So JSON, it's a JavaScript object notation. Okay, it's, it's, sim it's as simple as that. So if you actually look at the schema, this is something that a developer who wants to build something upon upon their framework, this means that other companies can actually code using this, I want to call it an idiot's guide, but you know, to some people this is very technical, um, but this gives you all of the variables in able to do pretty much anything that the main system can do itself. Okay, so this is the schema. These are the things that I used to integrate into these types of companies. And I've done this for 25 years. Okay, so this is the stuff that I work from. So now we have 
all of these other new things coming in you've got obviously BitConnect but now you've got Ethconnect and you've got Hextracoin and look how similar this looks you've got RegalCoin and you've also got ElectraCoin all of these all look so similar when you log in and you start playing with it you will see how similar all of these are and they're not just similar on the outset now I've been doing some digging obviously trying to find um, endpoints and APIs and signal calls and trace routes and stuff like that to find out where these transactions are coming from and where they're going and I have found a pattern but the pattern is obfuscated and when I say obfuscated it doesn't mean it's hiding it means it isn't coming from a single entity it means it's being built in such a way that no one person actually has access to it and that's really really clever now I, I found all the addresses which I've shown in the last video and if you look at the top 10 rich list on um, if you actually go to uh, CoinMarketCap and then go to BitConnect and then go to the uh, wallet uh, ledger and you can see the, the history of the top 20 uh, wallets you can see which ones are the hot wallets which ones are the savings accounts um, we've done a video already on how much money is in BitConnect what we need to do now is figure out where those endpoints lead and I've come to a round robin and when I say a round robin I'm thinking that things are moving around in various places and when you look at the transaction codes of what is going on and you try for the bot trades you're seeing that it has a very generic Bitcoin type uh, address but when you trace the address the figures are always zero and they're zero because it's it's like a shadow address it's being built from either a two or three or a two or four type signature and that sounds not like a segregated witness it doesn't sound like um, it doesn't sound like a multi-signature type deal because they have uh, their own signature in their addresses this is a normal address that has been put together where two or three of the recipients only have part of the code so what they're doing is is that there, there would be three nodes or four nodes and it requires two to combine two addresses to go to a third node that then decrypts it which then creates and obfuscates it and then sex, uh, puts the two pieces together to make an address so what this gives you is somewhere where you have a movement of money you have a transaction if this is a bot trade you will see that it will come from a, a hot wallet so a hot wallet is, is one that is uh, internet based and comes from live trades so live trades the way that commercial wallets are set up if they were going to do it one transaction at a time it would actually be very expensive once you add up all the transactions so what they want to do is to create a bank of transactions and send it as uh, as one transaction on the block now the way that those transactions have been working is that you don't it's now a trustless platform because the platform itself doesn't care or know or understand what is in that transaction all it is doing is hashing blocks and you have a, a 2 of 3 scenario or a 3 of 4 scenario or a 10 of 27 uh, scenario where where you have a consensus and you get the right result back there is no way of tracing that transaction it becomes completely um, completely off, off the chain uh, essentially because the, the two parts or the three parts of a transaction need to have the reciprocal uh, transaction key in order to unencrypt it and then you're only unencrypting other one part or, or, or one of two or one of three parts so you can never actually piece together and once that information is completed and you have a receive ping back to say yes I've got that and the transaction is complete it then deletes that part of the information so that is what is going on now with the trading bot and I've done that by API calls by reverse uh, tracing routes and um, you know, tracing a lot of the transactions and the IDs and figuring out which wallets it's going to so that is a real reason why people are finding it very difficult to find these transactions but what is even more important that you go to ElectroCoin or you go to Ethconnect or ETHConnect or you go to BitConnect they all have a very similar canonical signature that signifies that this is coming from a central point 
So when you say Ethernet looks just like BitConnect or mm, Regal Coin looks very, very much like BitConnect, yes, they are. And I think there's a reason for that. Um, now I've traced a lot of the trace routes. Now, most of these, uh, well, all of them, every single one uses a content delivery service to move stuff around, which means it masks the true IP. So you get the Cloudflare IP, which is the um, domain name. Uh, sorry, it's the, um, it's the, uh, it's this stuff here. If I go to Cloudflare, you will see that it's, uh, these products are all to do with content delivery networks. Um, so they all use Cloudflare just to obfuscate where those messages are coming from, as well as to spread those um, spread those around the place. So if we look at uh, CDM, you can see the locations where, they, where they're based. But if you go back to the main Cloudflare uh, place and you see where they distribute all of their stuff, if you live in Florida, then you know there's a Cloudflare center near you. So your data is actually coming from there, not from the UK or not from, you know, not from Vietnam or not from Australia or, or you know Dubai and you can trace if you go through to ETHConnect you know that where they're based you know that they are actually in Japan but their Cloudflare account is actually in San Francisco um, with ElectroCoin you can tell they're from a certain place you can say that BitConnect you know you know it's in Malaysia and they, a lot of the development is in Vietnam um, you know, the other one is in is in Dubai. You can actually trace where they are, even though their headquarters are Mickey Mouse and you know, Ethernet. You know now by in the media that that none of their names and and their pictures actually match who they're saying they are. They all have a very similar way of saying. And you know what? Um, this is who we say we are. But actually, if you dig into any of the information, we don't exist. You go to any of their offices, BitConnect included. Uh, I've had a few comments on YouTube. Oh, Roy, did you realise? Are you not worried if you're going to sign up to Ethernet that uh, you know on Twitter they found out that they they had Mickey Mouse names and they used some other guy um, other Twitter pictures? Like, yeah, I knew that already. Oh, aren't you concerned? It's like, well, do you use BitConnect? They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, did you realise that the CEO of BitConnect, Ken Fitzsimmons, does not exist, and neither does his address, and neither does his registered company, and you know, so if you're if you're not bothered by that, then why should you be bothered about this? Okay, two wrongs don't make a right, but there is a reason, and I think it's part of the platform that is controlling it. And I think these individual companies are going to a content delivery prov provider that specialises in creating this content. Now, the IP addresses. When I do the reverse proxy IP and I do a trace route to the origin there is a pattern emerging to all of these and these are the traceroute IP address um, bank. Now, if you're not in somewhere like uh, Rackspace or cloud hosting platform, or you're, you know, if, you haven't, if you're not using a big cloud provider like Amazon, most physical servers will be on a limited IP um, spectrum. So if you have 10 servers in a room, they will normally be canonical, so they'll be sequential and canonical, so you will see uh, IP addresses being very close to each other, if not sequential, um, because of the way that they talk to each other, because uh, they actually converse uh, as a cloud platform using local IPs, which is one of the reasons why we can't find, um, it can't show you very easily the bot and the actual um, uh, transactions because of the fact that it's actually behind not just a firewall, it's actually completely off the net because those transactions are just API calls. Um, you know, with the right encryption, it gets taken and accepted if it's got the right uh, encryption method and the right salting. Um, salting is a way of aggregating and then mixing up all the numbers. So it's a sec it's like a second layer of encryption. And if you've got the key, you can unsalt it. And if you've got the unsalt it, you've got the hash. And if you've got the hash power with the right node, uh, running the right software, then you can then decrypt the hash and get the information from it. So that's how that works. So everything is decrypted. So you, there's no point pinging IP addresses. It doesn't work. Like that. So the endpoints point to somewhere, and I've been digging into the endpoints, and the endpoints seem to come from a source that is the same for all of these other platforms. And I'm trying to think of reasons why. And in digging, I found the head, the head honcho, and it is a company called Enchain. Now Enchain 
have actually been around for quite a while, for a number of years. If you look at what they're doing, it hasn't said, I've, I've seen this site before, never really thought much of it. Um, let's scroll down. So it says, you know, our PhD qualified scientists, researchers and engineers are finding new ways to tap into the power of the blockchain and propel businesses into the future, transforming people's lives and the way in which businesses operate. Now, I'll let you go through the site in your own time. It's mchain.com. Enchain. Now, I was looked into their business practices and they don't actually sell anything. Not directly. They don't actually want anything. There is nothing where you can give them money. There's no way you can buy a service. What they are, are they are technology providers that will provide a blockchain solution a very sophisticated blockchain solution for anyone that comes up with the business plan where if that plan succeeds they will take a percentage of your revenues so imagine BitConnect for example they would go to a company like this or they would be invited they'd come up with a business case and they'd come up with some designs and they come up with some uses so they work together they collaborate they go away and they build something what they do is that this company will own the technology rights. Now, if you go into the technology rights, the patents in the last year, there are hundreds and they're all related to trading platform, um, trading platform you know, secrets and the way that they do everything. And they, it is really, really advanced stuff, this is. Um, now, they do have a group of companies and they won't tell us the group of companies um, that they're working with and they do have products which they say they cannot talk about because it's so secret because they would be chastised and shut down so that means they're working where the legalities in certain countries are certainly dubious so when you've got Ethconnect saying that they're actually in Japan and Japan says actually no you need to be registered to, be, to have an exchange in Japan and they're not on the exchange register that means they're actually the endpoints and the transactions, even though they may say they're based in Japan and they may actually be based in Japan, they're not because of the centralization of the network. And that is how they're getting around opening all these, selling all these cookie cutter websites and platforms. They come in, you make a proposal, we will give you the APIs, the endpoints. You have nothing to do with the trading bot. You just send us the transactions. We will process the bot. We will take our cuts and we will send you the, send you the transaction details. They will provide the, um, the, the platform itself and they say, here's the bare bones. You reskin it. You tell us what you want to do as your USP and you launch in a different market to where Bill and Bob and John and Jane are. So that seems to be how this process of why all of these things are cropping up now it doesn't mean to say that there are really dark nefarious reasons it's actually better because the technology they're using is using obfuscation uh, technology that means that they are using this new vision of a trustless society so they're building trustless products where you don't need to trust them to ensure that it works because there is no central point of failure so you're not going to have a Mt. Gox. So if this is actually, as I'm, I'm digging into, now believing because the IP addresses from their servers are on the same bank, and it just so happens this is what they're doing for a living, you know, this is kind of uh, Satoshi type stuff. So, you know, so be our next R&D specialist. So they're, they're looking for people. So we've talked about Cloudflare and how that works. Um, you know, we can't ping any of these by doing, um, if we actually go in and look at the servers, all you're getting is that Cloudflare. So uh, Cheryl.ns uh, at Cloudflare.com is actually uh, the name of the bank of servers. So they actually, they're so large, these data centers that each center has its own name. So Cheryl will be a whole uh, data center and Elliot will be for the NS2 version. So that's the A record. So BitConnect, you can see the IP address, but these are not the true IP addresses because they're masked, because they're actually provided from the endpoints, which is uh, Cloudflare. So this isn't something we can dig into, so we can monitor it and look at the ports and everything. So it's protected and there are big firewalls and everything. And then 
if we go into the triple, um, we go to the NS reports we've done already. Uh, if we go to the, tr uh, the the foray report now, foray is the IPv6 version, and these are actually canonical when they're released. Um, so if you can reverse reverse hash these, you can actually find out more information than you can from the A record. So if you go to this record here, for instance, and then what if we change that to hmm, Regal Coin? Let's try that one. Hmm, they seem to be within the same bank. So if you start digging into it and then doing the reverse proxies and actually looking at the text records behind this, you will actually see that these are actually co-hosted. They're not actually hosted by the same servers. The endpoints are in the same place. That so means the calling points where the data is going to and coming from is the same, even though that the servers are hosted in completely different countries and it looks like they're different people because they've come up with different ideas. I don't think it's just the same person re-releasing stuff all around the world. These are actually different companies. And the reason why is that Enchain doesn't care what you do with it. As long as it's on the trusted network, you're using their software. Um, the fact it's trustless, it means that they can just, just let it run. And they want competition. Why do they want competition? Because they take a small percentage of the pie. All they want is a bigger pie. That's how they make their money. Okay? That's how they make their money. I'm pretty sure they do all the pre-mining for them. I'm pretty sure they do a lot of the wallet creation for them and let the development team do the rest. So if you actually go back to, um, back to Ethernet, you can actually see when you log in, or you can actually see um, all the way down, you can see I mean, everything, everything you read on the trading and the lending, it's just reskinned. And as a new version comes out, you get the latest version of the platform that they've made with all the different features and benefits. So you probably find the one after Ethernet will be even better, or it'll have a different thing, or it will use this split key uh, transaction process, which means that ETHConnect is actually better on the look of it because BitConnect has a central server. It's a decentralized coin with a central server. ETHConnect is actually a semi-decentralized platform because the coin itself and the transactions are actually hooked onto the Ethereum protocol, the ERC20, which you can mine, by the way. I know lots of people have had loads of comments uh, saying, you know, that they're a scam because you can't mine ERC20. Well, no, you can't when it's out the box, but there are many ways of, of bashing it into place to make it work. It is open source platform um, after, you know, open source uh, after all. So um, there are many ways of doing it. it. It is possible. So I wouldn't worry too much about that. Um, so the other interesting thing on the Enchain website, if you go to the blog, now I've seen this chat before. This is uh, Jimmy Jimmy Wynn, and he is the chief IP communications and legal officer. Now, if you do ever go to this website, I really want you to actually listen to a lot of what he's saying. He's quite a swish-looking guy. He's, um, he really knows his stuff, but he his background is from um, intellectual property telecommunications and legal officer so he is the legal mind and follows this chap everywhere and if you don't know this guy this is Satoshi Nakamoto this is Dr. Craig Wright okay he's been pushing Bitcoin cash because it, it follows more of his original insights and, and his, his original white paper a lot of people go yeah but you don't know Dr. Craig Wright is actually Satoshi Nakamoto well actually I do um, I I'm an original developer on Bitcoin. I've been there since mid-2009. Uh, I was there before um, Gavin Anderson um, came in. So I was pre-Gavin Anderson now, who is the, uh, who's the head, uh, head developer, lead developer for Bitcoin Core. So I'm, I'm pre-Bitcoin Core. Uh, and I had lots of, um, lots of communications with, um, with Satoshi. And I actually did meet him uh, last year. I will say meet him, had a Skype with him last year. And he obviously knows of my work. He has followed me. I have followed him uh, after it came out. So I was actually the first person on Twitter actually to actually support him because I knew straight away it was. But when I actually did speak to him, he did refer to an email that only we had. So I had an email with uh, a conversation with Satoshi um, and he actually referenced 
uh, and it was his way of saying now you know for sure and no words needed to be said we just looked at each other and we just nodded and we just carried on with our conversation uh, of many of which we've had since so um, there you go I did not know that Craig Wright was the chief scientist at Enchain. so it looks like Craig Wright Satoshi Nakamoto himself who is putting all of this technology together for Enchain? It looks like this is one of his babies. So Satoshi Nakamoto strikes again. Where you go? There you go. Bit shocking. Um, if you really want to, I won't go through them now. I was actually going to click these and let you listen to some, but um, some of these are about half an hour long. Uh, have a look at uh, Craig Wright's uh, talk because it covers much of what I've talked about, and it does also talk about these. Um, uh, all these endpoints and the different types of stratifications on on transactions and wallets and where Bitcoin is going and all the different things they're adding to it and in a more slick and subtle way because Craig uh, can be a bit of an ass sometimes he's not the most personable person because most good developers aren't so um, actually I didn't rate his uh, C code anyway I was much better than him <laughs> I'm sure he won't mind he'll probably admit it himself uh, Gavin's a much better guy so um, Jimmy yeah have a look at Jimmy's as well he's um, he comes across really well and he actually gives more information um, this is more uh, background history and uh, and uh, theory so go and have a look uh, before we sign off uh, I want to go back to ETH Connect again I did a, the last video we did was uh, about ETH Connect and if I log in we did one and I actually put a referral link and said anybody that wanted to join the team or couldn't join the um, either or that has joined our team or um, really wanted to but they've signed up with someone else you know the links at the bottom if you want to give this a go and uh, if uh, three or four of you do then uh, we may make a dedicated uh, if connect uh, YouTube channel and if I scroll down to my referral link and I look now apart from the fact it says direct and the spellings wrong I've actually got 22 so I am absolutely gobsmacked uh, I am amazed so Guys, thank you so much for your support. Um, yeah, that's just page one. We've even got a second tier, second level as well. Um, we've got three pages. 22 of you so far. So, yeah, looks like we're going to be doing the channel, guys. F Connect YouTube channel. So, um, I was thinking, I'm trying to chat with my wife, see what her movements are and see if the kids are around and see what time the live launch is. For the eth connect i think it's four o'clock uk time and because it's also um halloween here we may have people knocking on the door and kids trying to trick or treat or do something crazy so i'm trying to figure out a quiet space i can go and maybe do a two-hour live reveal of the uh, eth connect platform and we may even do that live on the new channel so um, i'm putting together those new calculators for you um, for all of you guys don't worry it will be ready by launch day so um, I've got a few things I need to do make the templates get them ready for you and change all of the um, uh, someone asked me on YouTube the other day is it actually um, is, is it actually uh, going to be ready can you use the original BitConnect one and the answer is no because the uh, the rates are all different uh, and uh, the calculations will be different over time um, so no is the answer there's going to be dedicated ones branded for this and for all our for all our guys so um thank you so much i'm quite humbled I'm very humbled thank you very much and uh looks like we're going to carry on doing this and now i've got two huge youtube channels so i'll try and do it justice and as usual i'll really try and help you guys out now i've waffled on way too much uh if you want to sign up and you haven't already my little links at the bottom that's all i've got to say i'm roy murphy you're watching the bitconnect youtube channel and i will see you in the next video this video was brought to you by team smurf we bring you new videos, each and every day. To join our team, click the referral link below this video. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and interact with us in the comments box below. BitConnect. Creating wealth for everyone.